In our last, last Sunday evening, we discussed the amazing power that God has placed in baptism. I think the closest example that we have is what happened with Naaman when he dipped seven times in the Jordan River. Paul doesn't use that kind of an illustration. He uses the resurrection of Christ. He tells us that within the power of baptism is the same power that was exerted in Christ when God raised him from the dead. The spiritual death that we have brought upon ourselves when we committed a sin is just as lethal as Jesus' death on the cross. And after his death, he was raised from the dead. And when we, are, when we are baptized with him, we are raised with him and we enter into Christ. And we talked about this. I just wanted to put this up to kind of give you a review of what we talked about last week. And so after we died with him, we became his, work, his workmanship. God did something while we were in the water of baptism. He changed us. We were dead we were by nature children of wrath. We were without God, without hope, without the covenants. But now in Christ, those of us who were far off have been brought near. We can't fully comprehend exactly, but we're going to talk a little bit more about it this evening. Because God tells us we were created in Christ Jesus. Now the only other time we see this term is in Genesis chapter 1. We understand what a creation is. A creation is taking something and making it into what God wants it to be. And so Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that when we were dead in our trespasses and the uncircumcision of our flesh, he made us alive together with him. Now that's where Paul is going when he says in verse 10, we are his workmanship. We were dead, now we're alive. We were out of Christ, now we're in Christ. We were created in Christ Jesus. And then, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Same Greek word, same basic concept, only used, as I say, a few times in the scriptures, and always to describe God's working on something to make it what he wants it to be. And that's what happens when we go through the book of Colossians. Now, or excuse me, the book of, oh, go through the power of baptism. I want to talk about Colossians this evening. I'd just like you to read through with me this scripture. You are complete in him. Now, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is in Christ. We read that in Ephesians chapter 1. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blemish before him in love. And all of this was planned and designed. And so Paul tells us, that once we're in him, we're complete. There's nothing lacking anymore. Verse 11, in him, you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, this is another clear indication that God did something to us while we were in the water of baptism because we have been circumcised. Now, the word circumcision means to cut something off. Basically, circumscribe, you circumcut. So you're cutting around. And so in this case, this was done without hands. And we'll talk more about that in just a second. By the putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God. I can't see that we could possibly miss this connection. We're complete in him, we are circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you are also raised with him. Now, verse 13, you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. That's power. Made without hands. Let's talk a little bit about made without hands. It's used three times in the New Testament. Here's the first time. In him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Then the second time. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. That is, not of this creation. 
Then the last time he uses it is, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, as you look at those three concepts, not of this creation, not made with hands, eternal, you get the sense that this is something that God will do. That God himself, and this circumcision is not of this creation. Because everything in this creation is material, except the spirit that we have in our body. And it's the spirit we have in our body that is going to leave this creation and be taken into the new creation. And God tells us here that in the water of baptism, the spirit is made ready to leave this creation and enter seamlessly in fellowship in the next creation. Now, we couldn't do that if we still had sin. With sin, God cannot be in the presence of sin. And as long as there's any sin within us, we are separated from God. So when he talks about made without hands, I think there's something really deep in here. But again, we can't really go too much further than this. But what he, summing it up then, you're complete in him. Made whole. Complete. Everything that should be there, nothing lacking. We were circumcised without hands, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And then, buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him. And being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him. Now, before we leave this, I want you to notice that it says you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Something has to be cut away for me to become alive. What is it? Well, in him you were circumcised, made without hands, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. Again, this is very complicated material. I don't know how we could possibly fully understand what this means. That I have a body of the sins of the flesh. And that's what's holding me back. And that has to be cut off in order for me to be forgiven and in order for us to be made alive together with him. So clearly, we are a new creation by God's grace and by God's power. We didn't do anything. We just believed, repented, confessed, and allowed somebody to put us under the water. While we're under the water, we obey the gospel. The power of God unto salvation is activated. I'm buried, joining Christ on his tomb, buried with him, raised with him, crucified with him, circumcised by him, and then made alive together with him. And so when Paul says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, that's a profound statement. And again, I suspect that it's much more complicated than we can even comprehend. The more I study this, the more I realize that this is really not of this creation. God is dealing with things that are beyond our ability to comprehend, but we can accept them and we can work with them. So if anyone is in Christ, then we are a new creation. Born again, Jesus said, born of water and the spirit through the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. And so all of this is tied into that one particular act. And then now we are prepared for the next step. Old things have passed away. And God did this for us in baptism. Not one guilt that I had committed prior to being baptized. It's gone. I might not even remember. I don't think if, if God said, Alan, you have to confess every sin you've ever committed before I baptize you. I don't think I could do it. Could you? Think we could remember all of them? But God has taken care of that. There, what did Paul, what was Paul told? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins. Now, we understand that that is an illustration, but it's still true. 
In the water of baptism, our sins are cleansed. Peter says they're remitted or sent away. God tells us it's as far as the east is from the west, like the depths of the sea. So we leave that water a new creation, as pure, as holy, as righteous, as godly as we could ever possibly be. Pristine, ready for heaven. If we died right then, without ever having attended church services, without ever having worked on any of our weaknesses, we would be taken to heaven. All of us believe that. But again, it's only by grace, by mercy, and by the power and the majesty of God. That's where all of this starts. And that's where Paul wants us to start when he says old things have passed away. When I come up out of the water of baptism, it's all brand new spiritually. But now I've got to get busy because by grace I have it. But I don't know about you. I remember coming up out of the water of baptism and within a few days I was, I'd said a bad word. And I was ashamed of myself, but it popped out. And other thoughts started coming back. And other sinful desires. God didn't take those away. That's where the new things have to come. So when Paul says, put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, What's he talking about? I thought that was cut away from me. Well, the consequences were, and the opportunities to be holy were, but now I've got to get busy. I have to do the next step. God can't do that for me. Or let me rephrase that. I suspect he could have, but it's a fellowship. What does the word fellowship mean to us? It's a joint participation. Do you really want God to do everything and you don't even get to lift a finger? Or do you want to work with God? Do you want to, like Abraham, fulfill God's desires and plans so that he can look down upon us with a smile, with a sense of greatness that he sees us in that capacity? So you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man who was, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So God did everything we couldn't do, but he won't do anything we can do. That's what fellowship is. He wants me to be saved. I need to want to be saved. I need to put as much into this as God did. Or let me rephrase that. I need to put as much of this in as I possibly can to supplement what God did. And God did that, I, I think, for a couple of reasons. First of all, because we're saved by faith. And faith requires that we bring our lives into submission. So everything God asks us to do in the gospel is a test of faith, just like Abraham offering his son Isaac. And as one by one, I start cutting them off. Don't say bad words anymore. Crush those evil thoughts. Get rid of those bad attitudes and those foolish ways of looking at things and those terrible responses that we have learned. So God did his part and I need to do mine. So Paul goes on to say this in Colossians. Remember back in chapter 2, verse 13, you were buried with him and raised with him in baptism. So that's the context. So when it says, if then you were raised with Christ, he's, at, he's basically saying, if you've been baptized, if you've been buried with him in baptism and raised with him to walk in newness of life, if you truly were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. That's the new things. The old things, the old man, God made it possible for us to put it aside. And the new man, God made possible 
And again, that we draw from the power of the gospel and the Holy Spirit's fellowship. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are, if you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. There's a fellowship now. I'm with him. I'm in his body, first of all. He's my king. I'm his servant. He's my shepherd. I'm his sheep. He's the head. I'm part of the body. Just goes on and on and on. The analogies and the figures. He's the vine. I'm the branches. Seek the things which are above where Christ is. Set your mind on things above. Not on things on the earth. For you died. And your life is hidden with Christ and God. What does that mean? My life is hidden with Christ in God. There's something huge there. Verse 4, when Christ who is our life appears, you will appear with him in glory. There's some tie between Christ and myself that was bound together while I was in the water of baptism. And when I come up out of that water, now I've been raised with him to walk in a new life. So now I'm going to seek the things which are above because my life is hidden with Christ in God. And like I say, that's a very profound thought. It's something that we really need to consider. What exactly is he saying here? So the new is above and the old is on the earth. So what does he then say? Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. Verse 6. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. That's what God did for us. He cut all of that away. The very things that God is going to bring wrath upon the sons of disobedience. Paul said the same thing in the parallel passage in Ephesians chapter 2. You being dead in your trespasses and by nature children of wrath even as the rest. But God being rich in mercy made us alive together with him. By grace you have been saved through faith that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. When I come up out of the water of baptism, that's all cut off. There's no more wrath. I'm a son. You're a son or daughter. We're forgiven. We're alive in Christ. We're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Everything is new. But verse 7, you yourself once walked, when you lived in them, that's the anchor. That's one of the weights. Remember in, in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, lay aside the weights and the sin that so easily besets us and run with great patience the race. So this is what was removed by the circumcision of Christ. And so what God removed, let not man return to again. That's really Paul's point here. How did Peter put it? Like the dog or excuse me, like the sow that's been washed going back into the mire, like the dog returning to his own vomit. That's how God sees it, and that's probably putting it mildly considering what we really did. So what God put off, we put off. But now you yourselves are to put off all of these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. Now you see the difference. God did it with his power perfectly. Now I spend the rest of my life what, putting off what God put off. I put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Now, there's another question. What does that mean? What is the image of him who created him? My very last slide, we will see that we see him in a mirror 
and we are transformed into the same image. Well, what image is he talking about? Well, I think the verse we talked about this morning in the class helps us. Whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Christ is perfect. Every decision he made, everything that he taught, like Jesus told the Pharisees, if you were of God, you would love me. And you would long. To be like me. And so he predestined. He predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. We lost something significant when Adam and Eve sinned. We lost the image of God. We lost, we lost the image and likeness of God. And from that point onward, as Paul points out in chapter 5 of Romans, each successive generation, death passed to all men because all men sinned. And all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. There is no more image of God to even compare ourselves to. So God sent Christ. And when he sent Christ, it was his intent. It was his foreknowledge and his predetermined plan that we would be conformed to that image. Now, when he baptized us, that's exactly what he did. He conformed us to that image. But now what he did by grace, I have to make. And, you know, it's amazing. Jeannie and I have talked about this a couple of times. We read about what God did in the Bible. He made the dry ground and formed all the mountains in one day. And I get out there with a shovel and after a few hours, I'm wore out. And I didn't move hardly anything. But that's the difference. What God can do with his power in baptism is going to take me the rest of my life to toil and labor and sweat and agonize and struggle. And when it's all done, I'm going to look at what God did and what I did and feel about the same as I feel when I've gone out and shoveled in the yard all day. Whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So the likeness to Christ, which we gain when we die with him, buried with him, crucified with him, raised with him, circumcised by him in the water of baptism, now I'm conformed to his image. But for the rest of my life, and the rest of your life, we're fighting how did he put it? You have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. That's how much God would like us to hate sin. He's the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he glorified, or justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. So we're just completing the process that God started. Now, Peter puts it ex almost exactly the same way and, and as you well know, one of my favorite passages, 2 Peter chapter 1. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, first that's in the scriptures and then secondly, practically, it occurs when I obey the scriptures. It's kind of like we have access to power. We got, a cert we got a, uh, an outlet right there. And I can go get any tool I want that has a plug on it and I can plug it in there and I can start working. Well, God's divine power has put all those tools into the gospel. And so by his divine power, we have everything. Everything we need is in there. We don't need to go to men. We don't need the wisdom of men. It's all in the scriptures. That's why Paul said what he did in Colossians chapter 2. He said, in him you are complete. You don't need anything. You may, we talked this morning about the moods in the Greek, and we talked about the subjunctive, which means contingency. You might. It's not a given. You might be partakers of the divine nature. That's, that's the fellowship. That's the fellowship we were talking about. God did everything that he could do in baptism. Every power necessary, he exerted it. And when we came up out of that water, we were ready to run.
But now my will has to come into this. I've got to put my investment. God put his investment in. He created me. He sent his son to die for me. He allowed the blood to be accessible. He gave us the ordinances and the scriptures to make this possible. But now, what do I want? I want to sit in an easy chair and just let God do it all? That's how some Christians look at it. Peter says that's not possible. You may become partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. But it's only going to happen if you add on your part. Put off the old man. Put on the new man. Set your mind above where Christ is, not on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with God. If these things are yours and abound, you're not going to be barren or unfruitful. If you lack them, you're going to be short-sighted. You can't see what's above where Christ is sitting. You're short-sighted. You're blind. Make your calling and election sure. If you do these things, you will never stumble and an entrance will be supplied unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These are the new things. Add to your faith, virtue and knowledge and self-control and perseverance and godliness and brotherly kindness and love. For if these things are yours, that's what will happen. The old things pass away. At least they do by grace, but they don't naturally pass away. And I've met many, and you have too, worldly Christians who aren't busy completing the fellowship they promised. We entered into a covenant when we said, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We were entering into a covenant, the new covenant, a covenant, a contract, an agreement, a testament between God and me and God and you. Personal. And God's watching. James chapter 2. Faith without works is dead. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Paul said in chapter 8, we are waiting for the redemption of our body. The soul's been redeemed. The soul was perfected and made as clean and pure and holy and alive as it could possibly be by the grace of God. But the body is still mine. And what I do with that body, the things done in the body, you remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5? We're going to stand before the judgment bar of God, or excuse me, the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done in the body, whether they be good or or whether they be evil. Well, how could they be evil? God did. Well, because it's it's under my control. God didn't do this for me. He didn't do it for you. He made it possible. But at some point in our life, we have to make the decision. How much of my body am I going to give to God? How much of my life? How much of my money? My time? My priorities? My emotions? My activities? My thoughts? How much of it is God's? How much of it is still mine? Well, the things we repent of every day are the things we're holding on to. And like Peter said, or no, I think it was Paul. What benefits do you have in the things of which you are now ashamed? And you know, every night before we go to sleep, we go back in our minds and we think about all the shameful things we did in the body or we did in the mind. Because to that degree, we haven't presented ourselves yet. We're still holding back. I still want a little of it myself, Lord. As long as we're doing that, we're not going to be happy. We're not going to be at peace. We're not going to feel consecrated and holy. And we're going to be struggling with guilt and remorse. As Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and pressing on to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, 
which is your reasonable, or some translations have your spiritual service. Logical. Spiritual. Makes sense. Part of the covenant. God did his part. It's the interesting thing about the gospel is God gives everything to us on a silver platter and then stands back to see whether we'll do our part or not. You and I'd probably do it just the opposite. We'd wait to see if somebody was going to put forth any effort before we'd give them anything. And the more effort they put forth, the more we would give them. God doesn't do that. God gives everything to us. And then he says, what are you going to do with this? He did the same thing in the in original creation. He made a beautiful creation. And he placed it in the power, completely in the power, so much so that one decision ruined everything. But that's how much God gave Adam and Eve, and that's how much power he gave to them. Sometimes it just amazes me how much control God gave to Adam and Eve. But that's what free will is. That's why God gave it to us, and he wants to see what we'll do with it, and the consequences are eternal life or eternal condemnation. Verse 2, do not be conformed. Old things passed away. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. I've wrestled with this a little bit over the last couple of weeks because I think most of the transformation is in the water of baptism. I think that in the water of baptism... God does something very similar as what the caterpillar does when it's in the cocoon. And when the caterpillar comes out of the cocoon, it's a totally different creature. It's a new creation. But with those of us with free will, he doesn't finish it. He makes it possible, but he doesn't finish it. Notice the tense. Do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So God is still working the transformation process. It's not me. Because the power of the word, which is the Holy Spirit working in my life through the word, makes this transformation possible. The fruits of the spirit are the transformation process. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, and, and again, I don't have to go through the litany of things that it brings. <clears throat> I always like giving the Greek word when it's our word. You ever heard the word metaphor or metamorphosis? It comes from the Greek word meta, which denotes a change of place or condition, and morpho, which means your form. So transformation means you are changing the place or condition of your form. Now, we see this when a tadpole becomes a frog. We see it when a, a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. So the gospel makes the metamorphosis possible. In the lesson we're going to talk about next week, I have a slide. You can look at it if you want to because it's in the article that I wrote yesterday. And it shows a monarch uh, caterpillar, which is about the size of your thumb, but it's about that long. It's an amazing creature. We saw a lot of them in California because that's where they go to mate. And so there's a lot of them there. And it shows how this thing attaches itself to a leaf and how it slowly builds a cocoon around itself. And then in the next set of slides, it shows how that butterfly comes out. And you look at this green, ugly, fat-looking thing that's, a, that's the, the caterpillar. And then you look at the butterfly, and you think to yourself, how in the world could that happen? <coughs> well, the obvious answer is God made it possible. He makes the impossible possible. And because we see it all the time, we don't stop and give God the glory. But I'll tell you, you look at that slide and you just it just causes me to just, I can't comprehend this. But it's nothing 
compared to what God did for us in baptism and what God is doing to us since baptism through the power of the word. So the gospel makes it possible, but we have to complete the process. How do I complete the process? By the renewing of my mind. Now, I didn't finish the verse. Let's go back and look at that real quick. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What does the word prove mean here? I know it's true. What does he mean, prove it? Well, I think what he means is, is that you actually do it and see how well it works. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. It's not in man that walks to direct his own steps. Be transformed by renewing your mind, by putting all of God's will to the test and seeing that in every way it's better. The good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Whoop. I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. There's the image we're conformed to. That's where our metamorphosis will end. When, as we, say, as we sing in our songbook, when my will and your will become one. When I want to do your will more than my will, the transformation is complete and I'm back where I was in the Garden of Eden because in the Garden of Eden, naturally, we only wanted to do the will of God because we were created in his image and his likeness. And as Moses told the people in that day, these commands which bring us back to his image are for our good always. Or as John puts it, they're not grievous, they're not burdensome, they're better. I came that they may have life more abundantly. When we are conformed to this image, the metamorphosis is reaching its completion. Sadly, as Paul pointed out, it's never going to happen because every time we get to the top of one, there's another. And so the metamorphosis is a lifetime process, but God is intensely interested, brethren, in how we're going about it and how important it is to us that we make these changes. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, same Greek word, metamorphosis. We are going through a metamorphosis when with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord in the scriptures, we are transformed into the same image. That's the third time we've seen that. He foreordained that we would be conformed to his image. And we were made and striving to be in that image. And now he tells us how it's done. This is the mirror. That's why we read our Bibles every day. Look it in the mirror. Remember what James said? Like the natural man who beholds his face in the mirror and then straight away forgets what kind of person he was. We do it all the time in the physical realm. We do it all the time in the spiritual realm too. That's why we need to keep looking in the mirror to be reminded. Oh yeah. I remember when Alan preached on this a few weeks ago and I made a commitment. But you know something? I forgot what kind of man it was. And now I just read the scripture. And now the image is back in my head. Because you know something? You can't change yourself in the same image if you can't remember what the image looks like. So with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory, which we received in baptism, to glory. Does that sound familiar? Whom he justified, he glorified. Those he foreknew and predestined to be conformed, he called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. What an amazing adventure Christianity is. What a wonderful opportunity for exploration, for growth and development, 
for preparing for eternity to seamlessly go from this life into the life to come. And like Moses and Elijah, continue to work in God's eternal purpose. I'm amazed that God sent Moses and Elijah to talk to Jesus about his coming death in Jerusalem while on the Mount of Transfiguration and allowing Peter, James, and John to see it. It's incredible what it reveals to us. Jesus said, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And Moses and Elijah were still alive because they continued to serve God just like they did on earth, but now they've gone into heaven. And that's why we said this morning, if you don't enjoy keeping the commands of God and being a Christian and sacrificing for the Lord, heaven's not going to be beautiful for you. You're not going to like it there. Because although we talk about the blessings of heaven, it's our new lifestyle. That is the greatest thing of all. To never commit a sin again. To never fall short. To never feel guilt and remorse. To never feel dirty and defiled and disgusted and frustrated and irritated at ourselves for letting the, sin, the, the lust of the flesh hoodwink us and trick us one more time into bringing ourselves. That's never going to happen again. And so if we put off the old man and we put on the new man, we're being transformed. There's a metamorphosis going on. And you know the fun thing about this is you can look back at yourself and you can see I'm not the same person. When I came up out of the water baptism, I'm a totally different person because the metamorphosis has continued. And hopefully I'll live long enough so I'll be able to look back on this day and say, I can't believe how much I've changed since then. Because that change should be going on all the time. We should never reach a point where we're treading water. We're always moving, changing, growing, exploring, investigating, changing our views. As we open our songbook to number 540, I hope that all of us are just in awe of what God has done for us up to this point. How much he did versus how much he expects us to do. It's incredible. What Jesus did on the cross and what I have to do. Think about that a lot when I'm drinking this sweet cup of grape juice and I'm thinking of the cup he had to drink, thinking to myself, he sure did a lot more than me. I have nothing to complain about. As we sing number 540, if there's anyone in the audience this evening who's heard about baptism and understands his power and is ready to have God do that for them. Or if as a Christian, you've stopped being transformed, you've allowed the sins of this world, you're just treading water, you're not growing, you're not developing, you're not in fellowship, you're not trying to get to the same image, This is a great opportunity. And you'll rue it someday in eternity if you don't buy it up. If we can help you in any way, please come while we together stand aside.